الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله اللهم العن اول ظالم ظلم حق محمد وال محمد واخر تابع له على ذلك اللهم العن العصابه التي جاهدت الحسين وشايعت وبايعت وتابعت على قتله اللهم العنهم جميعا ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد One of the most concerning matters when it comes to raising your children is the manner in which we talk to our children and the manner in which we discuss matters with our children. Some people deal with their children like they were dealt with or like their forefathers dealt with their fathers where everything is with an iron fist. The child speaks out of turn, they strike the child. The child is scolded constantly. The child is always given derogatory names, always being abused. Then there are those that are the complete opposite. You know, the people where their children are so spoilt, the child will walk on his dad's head and his dad's smiling, and as if nothing's going on. The child will, if he wants to, he could regurgitate all over the couches, and parents don't care. They don't matter what the child does, their son or daughter is perfect. When it comes to raising my children, and rearing my children and nurturing my children I need to meet somewhere in a middle road can someone turn off the Disney Channel please um, Salaam Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Why do we wait for me to tell people to do this? Like when it's happening, can we try and get it dealt with? The, the majlis is small; it's not even congested. Hello, I don't mind if people talk. I, ha I get irritated by my voice too, but it makes it difficult when they're next to the mumbar because it's right in your ear. It's like when you're out in the summer and the mosquitoes are all buzzing around you. Then anyway, so when it comes to raising my children there is a method and as they say you catch more flies with honey sometimes the nicest method is always the best method and a child is a human being too so if I look at a child as they are not a human being and I deal with them in the manner that they are not then I will not speak to them I need to speak to others like I wish to be spoken to if I sit there and I call them names, if you call your child, Allah, if you, if you want to tell your child, don't do this, and you refer to them with an animal name, the child will sit there and then he'll use that word on his sibling. And it'll be a common practice in the children in working. So when we look at the way that Luqman exhorted his child, and this is something Allah Azza wa Jalla has given a whole surah about Luqman. And Luqman was a wise man. When he begins to address his child, he addresses him with the word, Ya Bunay. He begins to call him, Oh my son. But when you say Bunay, it's a musagar of it. It's like tazgir for the word. It's like when you are speaking in a really nice way, in a really polite way. 
Huh? You, when you say, Ya Bunay, O oh my son, and you say it in a very nice way, the child will listen. In general cases, some children need something else. But in this case, he says, Ya Bunay, and then he begins to exhort him. He begins to teach him. And in the manner that he teaches him, he begins to teach him what is essential in life. And we'll cover these as we move along. We can break the teaching into four parts. In the first part, he mentions, لا تشرك بالله إن الشرك لظلم عظيم The first thing he exhorts his child with, which is paramount, and it is the most important teaching to teach your child is the existence of God, firstly, and who or what God is. The child needs to know, because if I don't have the ma'rifah, I don't have the understanding of what God is and the position of God is, I don't know how to deal with God. And if you look at when we say, لا تشرك بالله إن الشرك لظلم عظيم Firstly, he mentions do not take partners in Allah. Do not associate with Allah because association or taking partners with God is what? A great oppression. When we say dhulam, what is dhulam? When you talk about adil and dhulam. Dhulam is basically, when we say injustice, it's placing something in other than its place. Putting something in its incorrect position is dhulam, is oppression. So we begin here by saying if you take partners with God, you have done this. Because Allah Azza wa Jal emphasizes on this. From the very beginning to have one God and one creator, you obey only God. Whatever comes from God, you accept. Whatever is not from God, you reject. If I associate with God, then I have the problems that we have in the world today. When people say, why is there so much evil in the world? Because people don't worship one God. People don't obey one God. People don't follow one God. Everyone makes their own rules. Everyone makes their own regulations. It's okay for me to do it. It's not okay for you to do it. And honestly, if you look today, there was the sentencing of the, um, the, the killer of the Christchurch massacre. He killed 51 people. I just want to give you an idea. See this guy that killed 51 people. His time in prison, his incarceration, costs taxpayers money $4,932 per day. $5,000 per day to keep this guy behind bars. And how old is he? What, 30? Was he 31, 32? So this guy could live for another 40 years. Okay? Do the math. This is how much money it's going to cost to keep this guy behind bars. Where in, under Islamic law, this person would have been executed, that's it. He would have only cost, what, probably a stone to sharpen the sword with. And that's it. On his way to Jahannam, or Bitsal Masir. Would have been a done deal. It would have been finished. You wouldn't have to spend 5000 Because the, this is injustice. Imagine how many families you could feed with that $5,000. How many poor people you could feed with that $5,000. That they're going to spend just to look after a killer. This is dhulam. This is oppression. Someone might come and say, oh, look at the justice of this country. And a lot of people that live in the West, they talk like this. Look at the adil, even a killer, they look, this is not adil, this is dhulam. For someone like this to live like that is oppression. It's oppression to the masses because it comes out of your pockets, the ones paying tax. That's whose pockets it comes out of. Next time you go purchase something from the shop and see an increase in the price, no, this guy is taking something of that money that you pay. When you pay more income tax from these people, this is a form of oppression. So if the law of God is not applied, then we form, we see what is called injustice. This is the first part of what he says. And the first part in the khutbi, or the, sorry, the mawa'idah, 
of Luqman to his son is about the usul, our fundamentals of our belief. When I say our fundamentals of our belief, I mean the things that we find essential to our our belief and what we follow. Of which is what? First is Tawheed. And the second is Al-Adl. That Allah is just. Allah does not oppress. And everything will be taken in its place. So the first thing it mentions, he mentions to him is that they're not to take partners in Allah Azza wa Jal. The second thing that he makes mention to his son is Ya Bunay. Second part. He says, Innaha intaku mithqala habbatin min khardal. That even if it's what? If it's the weight of a grain of mustard. He's talking about the actions of mankind. Even if it's the weight of a grain of mustard. Fatakun fi sakhra. Aw fi samawat. Even if it's in the heart of a rock. Or high above in the heavens. For samawat. Could you imagine somewhere like hidden in the in a galaxy, somewhere far, far away? He says, O fil ardi yati bihallah in Allah latifun khabir. That even if it's hidden somewhere far away, you've done something that's hidden from the world on the day of judgment, it will be poured and it will be presented before you. Did they say they will open the book and they will say, Ma li had al kitab? La yugadiru sagira tam wala kabira? Allah sa. That when you see your book on the day of judgment, not even a small thing or a great thing, it will all be accumulated, it will all be there. So, what is he teaching him here at this point? He's teaching him number one, that Allah sees all. Number two, there is accountability for your actions. You can't just say, Khob, I'll just do this, inshallah khair, we'll see what happens from this. I'll just do it. I'll worry about this later. You know, or have that attitude where everything's going to be overlooked. Allah Azza wa Jal will forget all these things and will move along. This is the first thing that he looks at is Usul al-Din. Sallallahu Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The second part, he talks about also fundamentals of religion, but he, he talks about the actions. The actions that are required in your faith. This is teaching you how to raise your children. Firstly, you mention to them why we are here. Well, your children will ask, what's the purpose of life? Why are we here? Everyone asks, what's the purpose? And you have to tell them this is a test. There is a creator. And in the creator requires of us to do what's right so we can get the right account. Then he mentions what is right. What is it that I need to do? He says, He ya bunayya aqim as salata wa marub al ma'roof wa anha an al munkar. So, firstly, he mentions to him prayers. And prayers is so fundamental. As a, as a child, I remember one of the things that I, my father used to drill into us was to pray. Pray on time. He says, whatever you do, just keep praying. No matter what you do, keep praying. Number one, he says, if you do go wrong, you can always turn back and ask Allah for forgiveness. But if you don't pray, you have to repeat, you repeat your prayers, regardless. So if you go, all right, I go wayward for two years, and then I don't pray for those two years, when I come back, I have to repeat those two years. But if they're done, they're done. The second thing he said was, Salah will always bring you back to your path. If you're praying, it will bring you back. One day this salah that you pray will eventually get you away from what is bad. Upholding the prayer is so important. The other thing about prayer that makes it so important, that prayers are the pillar of religion. That if your salah is accepted, all your acts are accepted. Every good action you do is accepted. If your salah is rejected, this is a hadith, all your actions are rejected. Allah doesn't accept you, but you don't pray. What's the purpose of anything you do? If you don't pray, nothing's accepted. The thing is, people uh, uh, amuse me sometimes. They turn up to Majelis Abu Abdullah Hussein, they don't pray. 
And you ask them why they go, oh, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. I say, Imam Hussein alayhi salam had people killed defending him while he was praying. If it wasn't that important, Imam Hussein alayhi salam would have said, hold on, put the prayers aside, we'll worry about the prayers later, let's go to war right now. This is how important the prayers are and upholding the prayer and making sure you pray. Even when you say the adhan, it changes everything in your house. People that have adhan in their house, when you say the adhan, everyone in your house is affected by this. They know when the adhan happens, everyone just stops. They know it's a time to stop everything I do and hayya ala salah. Rush to my prayer. Hayya ala al falah. Rush to success. Hayya ala khair al amal. To rush to the greatest of deeds. It's the deed that every prophet and every imam emphasized and instructed people to to do. Even Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad and As-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi on his deathbed. On his deathbed. What did he say? He said, our shafa'ah, our intercession does not reach the ones that take their prayers lightly. We do not, it's not for people that don't pray. For people that don't pray, we have people that don't pray. The Prophet says, bury them he says, do not wash them, do not, he says, do not wash them, do not shroud them, and bury them with the Yahud or the Nasara. Don't even bury them with the Muslims, the ones that don't pray. He says, the ones here, not other ones that don't pray, the ones that take their prayers lightly, you know, the ones that do their prayer qada, they leave it to later. What does he say? He says, they will not get our intercession on the Day of Judgment. And this is what you require to enter paradise. The intercession of Ahlul Bayt alayhum as if I ignore my prayer and it's to think about it, it's a tragedy. Our prayers, the whole prayer in general, to miss out on your prayer is a tragedy. Why? You saw the way you watched the Jama'ah being prayed. How long did that prayer take? Nothing. It wasn't even. It wasn't even. It, it was. It was less than a warm up you do for a training session. This prayer that you pray, that probably takes, if you look at every rik'ah, one minute. Okay? That'd be 17 minutes of your day. And there's three times that you do wudu. One for the subah, one for dahar and asr. One for maghrib and isha, that's three minutes. 17 plus three, that's 20 minutes. 20 minutes of your whole day, you have 24 hours in your day. You're 1,440 minutes in your day. So you've got 20 minutes out of 1,440 minutes. That's one out of, if you broke up your day into 72 parts, one out of the 72 parts of your day, you're praying. Day. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. One out of 72 parts of my day, I'm doing what? I'm praying. That's all. Just one out of 72 too. So for me to neglect this and to turn this away and find it too burdensome that I don't pray. And Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't burden us with much. Allah wants ease. Allah wants Life is difficult but religion is easy. It's not difficult. Allah has made it easy for us to follow. People neglect this and they turn away from this. As for the other part, why is he telling him to enjoin good and prohibit evil? This is what fixes your community and your society. I'll tell you a story before I get to it. Enjoining good is when you see someone doing something. Do not spare time, tell them to get up and pray. Prohibiting evil, if you see someone doing something wrong, prevent them from doing this wrong. One year... I was at the Hajj, and there was a gentleman with us, a brother with us in the Hajj. And this guy, I know him, he wasn't a religious person. And I was surprised, you know, when you see someone like that in the Hajj, you're surprised. So I said, MashaAllah, you've come to the Hajj. So I like to know, I go, what made you come to the Hajj? Because he's young. Alhamdulillah. What is it that brought you to the Hajj? He said to me, I wanted to purchase a boat. 
And I said, yes. He said, I wanted, but when I said boat, I thought, you know, I'm thinking a boat, I'm thinking a little, you know, a small boat. But this guy was actually purchasing a yacht. He was just being modest. So when he said he went to purchase this boat, this yacht, he said, I asked one of the brothers in the Islamic community, he said, I asked him to t tell me if there's someone that knows about boats so I can take them. You know how you take a mechanic with you to go, or a panel beater to check out a car before you purchase it. He said, I'll take this guy with me to go check out the boat. So he said, I took him with me. I met the guy, he said, I know him by name, by face, but I don't know him properly. He said he looked at the boat, and he told me it was a big boat. It even had a big screen TV in it, you know, it was a proper yacht, and all this kind of stuff, somewhere where you'd say, all right, I'll get out of my house and live in this. So he said, I had a look at it, and he said, when we had a look and we're going to purchase it, I purchased it. It was a big amount he purchased it for. And then he said, I told the, the guy that showed me, you know, that this was a good, the one that checked it out for me. I said, would you like to come this weekend with me for a fishing trip? So he said, um, it depends. So I said, I turned around and said, depends on what? You know, he said, because this guy's a fisherman, he likes fishing. If anyone says, come for a fishing trip, they won't usually say no. He said, I don't know you. He said, do you pray? He said, what has me praying got to do with a fishing trip? He goes, a lot. He said, what do you mean a lot? He said, I'm afraid we're out in the sea past the heads. We're out in the ocean. We're fishing. And if you don't pray, God decides that's the time he's going to punish you. And I'm in that boat, I'm going down with you. He said, when he said that to me, my whole life flipped up and down. This guy was worried about that and I hadn't been praying. He said that at that point, I went and reflected over what he said to me. And I made the decision, I'm going to start praying. Not only that, he said, I put my name down to go Hajj day. That same year, that's where I met him and he told me the story. Now, didn't stop there. Look at the effect of Amr bin Maruf Nahal Munkar. We returned back to Lebanon. When we got to Lebanon, he saw people shopping. He asked, what are you purchasing? They said, we're buying Islamic stuff. And he saw people buying Islamic clothing, you know, for their wives and that. And he said, my wife doesn't wear hijab. This is what I, I'm telling you the story is that happened. He said, my wife doesn't wear hijab. This is what he said to us. And he, he, I was standing there. He picked up the phone. He called us. Salam alads. He goes, I want you to start wearing hijab. I'm going to buy hijab for you. And the whole way he was getting affected, all from what? Just someone giving him a reminder. That's all Amr bil Ma'roof and Naha al-Munkar is. It's a simple reminder because sometimes someone tells you something and you wake up. You're in a slumber. It had that much of an effect on him. It had that much of an effect that he went in the right direction from a simple reminder. And if I don't remind others around me, then I should not be upset when the whole world collapses around me. I should not be upset when there's fasad all around me. When I sit there and I accept, and if I accept non-religious practice, if I visit people who I know drink in their house and I enter their house and I don't make an issue over that because I don't want to upset them. Or if I allow people immodestly dressed into my house. I remember once I had to solve a problem and a lady came to my house and before she came, I told her, do you wear hijab? She said, no. I said, you have to wear hijab before you come to my house. She said, okay. She turned up and I said, you must be wearing it properly too. But when she turned up, I just want to let you know why you should be brave. She said, why do you enforce that I wear hijab in your house? I said to her, if you wanted to walk into a club, any of these clubs, like an RSL club or one of these diggers clubs, these walk... And you went in wearing a singlet, would they allow you in? 
They won't. You have to wear a collared shirt. They won't allow you. And this is a place that sells khamr and gambling. And you have to wear a dress code that is, that is acceptable there. And you people will wear the collared shirt and enter. Why is it when you're told to wear something modest, you get upset in people's houses? Why is it people find it difficult to enforce laws like this? This is the purpose of these laws. Tonight, obviously, the Majlis will surround Al Qasim ibn Hassan. Unfortunately, I don't have the allowable time in order for us to give a Majlis in English. But most of you obviously can understand Samahat al Sheikh in Arabic. But tonight we'll be surrounding, and I'll, I'll continue this sermon tomorrow night when we will be the night of Ali al Akbar. But tonight will be about Al Qasim ibn al Hassan. Al Qasim ibn al Hassan alayhi salam, alayhi salam was the son of Imam al Hassan who was raised by Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. So although he was the son of Al Hassan, he was raised by Imam Hussein. He was raised to a point to know his ma'rifa and his understanding of what was required from him from God. That on the night where the Imam asked the companions, gave them the permission to flee in the darkness, and for those that wish to re remain, to stay, but the rest can leave. On this night, when the those that remain. He informed them of the martyrdom. Al Qasim came up and said to his uncle, Am I one of those that will be martyred, O oh, uncle? And the Imam then asked him a question. First, you have to test someone to see what they're like. He said to him, How do you perceive death? Imagine someone, you're asking a youth, you know, most youth, you ask them, How do you find death? They'll tell you, I'm afraid, everyone. We can talk normally here, but when it, the, the reality hits, people are afraid of death. So to see what his temperament was, to see what his position was, to see the way he was feeling, Al Qasim says, I find it sweeter than honey. For me, it's sweeter than honey at a young age. Why? Because he has been raised in the right way. He's been reared in the right, right, right way. He's been nurtured in the right way. That spirit of truth is within him. That understanding of his position, that death is inevitable. We are all headed towards this path, regardless whether we accept it or we don't lower our heads and accept. It will come to us and will meet our demise there. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal not to take us from this world until he is pleased with our actions. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept what we have done in these nights and our small contribution to the great cause of Imam Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.